Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's New in Historical Fiction, a regular panel series featuring historical novelists with new and upcoming titles. My name is Colin Mustful. I will be hosting the program. I am the founder and editor of History Through Fiction, which is an independent press out of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul that publishes historical novels that are based on real people and real events. Um, I'm really excited that you could all be with us. We have a great group of authors here tonight, and it will be should be a really fun conversation. Um, if you want to interact with us at any time, go ahead and use the chat on the bottom of your screen. You should see a chat button that will open up the chat feature in the right side of your screen. Um, those of you who have just joined us, go ahead and just say hello. Let us know where you're joining from. Um, in addition to that, I have put together a landing page with all of our panelists' books. And so if you want to learn more about those books, you can go to that landing page. I'm going to copy and paste the link here in the chat in just a second. And that landing page, if you want to purchase one of our panelists' books, will the, the links will send you to bookshop.org. Uh, we always support bookshop.org because they give a portion of the sales back to local booksellers, and we want to be able to support uh, booksellers as well as supporting our authors here. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to send myself to the top of the screen, and then we'll introduce our panelists. Uh, so Eric, uh, could we start with you? Just uh, tell us a little bit, bit about yourself and your novel. Of course. So uh, my name is Eric. I'm from Los Angeles, California, and I wrote the novel South of Sephiroth. Uh, South of Sephiroth is a fictional retelling of a true historical event known as the 1492 expulsion of the Jews from Spain. And um, basically what was happening during this time period is Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand succeeded in um, conquering the Iberian Peninsula, what we today know as the country of Spain, um, from Muslim rule. And one of the first things they did with their new Spanish empire was they decided to um, force all of the Jews within Spain to either convert to Catholicism or leave never to return. And so this novel is the story of a family of a Jewish family that lives in Granada, which was the last Muslim stronghold in Spain, who make a decision to um, flee Spain together before this decree goes into effect so that they can preserve their religion and um, be free in another country. And the novel is being published by History Through Fiction. We're really excited about that. Uh, next, we have Robin Oliveira. Robin, if you could say hello and let us know about your novel. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Robin Oliveira. I live outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, I have, my fourth novel is A Wild and Heavenly Place. It's coming out tomorrow from Putnam. And it is the story uh, it's a great big love story, 19th century continent spanning love story, which I wanted to write because I used to love to read those uh, when I was a teenager. But it's set, uh, it begins in Scotland and it ends in the Pacific Northwest. I did a lot of history for it because I really like to illuminate forgotten history and do a lot of research in order to give us, you know, sort of the bones of history for my characters to walk through. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, I did not know that your novel comes out tomorrow. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Sarah Ackerman. Sarah, if you could say hello and let us know about your novel. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm Sarah Ackerman. I am an author from Hawaii. My, um, I'm actually the author of five World War II books set, set here in the islands. Um, and then my book that just released on last Tuesday is The Uncharted Flight of Olivia West. Um, this novel, my first non-World War II novel, is um, it's a fictionalized retelling or telling of a story about the Dole Air Race, which was a race to be the first to cross the Pacific in 1927. Um, and then it's a dual timeline as well. So it's also a story about the woman who uncovers her uh, the very secrets of this race 60 years later. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I'm really interested to hear more about that race. I knew nothing about it, so it sounds really fascinating. And finally, we have uh, Tara Carr Roberts. Uh, Tara, if you could say hello and let us know about your novel. 
Yeah, hi. Um, I'm my name's Sarah. I'm in Moscow, Idaho, which is up in the Panhandle, top of Idaho. Um, and my book is called Wild and Distant Seas. It is a historical fiction, but with some magical elements, beginning with a very, very minor character from Moby Dick in 1849 on the island of Nantucket. And then it follows four generations of her family um, all over the world until about 1905, 1910, I should know. Um, eventually ending up uh, in Brazil, Italy, Idaho, and then back in Nantucket. Thank you, Tara. Uh, we already had a comment from Linda. She says, I'm a female air racer. I don't know. I've never heard of that. Uh, Sarah, do you know what that is? An air racer? Yeah, we have a female air racer in our audience. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about that. Well, let's go uh, back to Eric. Uh, Eric, you talked a little bit in your introduction here about uh, the the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Um, can you give us a little bit more about the history of the Alhambra decree? And also, you know, we published your novel because uh, you were able to bring it to life with your characters and with this Jewish family. So tell us how you brought that history to life and made it real. Of course. So the Alhambra decree is basically the decree that made that that basically made that decision of you can either convert to catholicism or you can leave never to return um and it was written by isabel and ferdinand shortly after they conquered granada and all of spain and uh what it, it gave also motivations for why they wanted to kick out the jews um but it also said one thing i left out in my introduction is that the jews who wanted to leave they had basically they had three months to leave or convert and if they refused to comply they'd be put to death um, so you basically had to make this decision, and um, while the book follows characters who left, many many Jews did convert because of this decree, and they ended up becoming Catholic, but also being uh, having to hold up to the scrutiny of the Spanish Inquisition for the next 300 plus years. And really, with the characters of this book, and there's there's uh, several good um, historical textbooks and nonfiction books on this topic. But what I always wanted to get to was who were these people? Um, what was the human experience like to go through the situation where um, someone invades your kingdom, the kingdom of Granada, and says that you need to convert or leave? And I wanted to show what that's like on the ground from the perspective of a family. And the book is not just about, it, the book is so much more than just the expulsion. It's about how does this family, what's the family dynamics? How do they manage to uh, leave Spain together, is it a better idea to maybe stay? Because it seems, with not knowing about the Spanish Inquisition at that time, it seems like it might be easier for them to stay than risking their life to travel to another country. So all of these sort of ideas and um, obstacles are put to, that really happened, are um, put to life through the, this fictionalized family that takes us through the novel. Yeah, such a heart-wrenching choice. I can't imagine being put in that position, but that's kind of what, what you do with the novel is help us to understand that. Well, Robin, your uh, characters, Haley and Samuel, uh, two young people in Scotland, they, they leave voluntarily uh, for the Western United States. So tell us about Haley and Samuel. Why did Haley leave? And then what led Samuel to follow? Okay, so um, Samuel Fittis, my male protagonist, I have two protagonists in this novel, is a 17-year-old young man, a Scotsman in Glasgow, who cares for his five-year-old sister, Allison, in the tenements of Glasgow after um, fleeing uh, an orphanage called Smilham Orphanage. It's an historic orphanage, and uh, there was recent inquiry into it, and I used a lot of the witness testimony in the novel itself. He, um, his father was a shipbuilder before he died and these two were sent to the orphanage. Samuel has fled the orphanage. Now he's trying to make a life for himself and it's very difficult because Scotland was a class society. He had no money for education and he had to care for his young sister. He meets and falls in love with Haley McIntyre who is the daughter of a wealthy coal mining engineer. Uh, who and they live in the upper crust west end. Um, Haley possesses home, she possesses family, she possesses stability, but she aches for a different kind of life. There is a financial disaster for the McIntyre family unforeseen. It was the historic 
failure of uh, the Bank of Glasgow, which uh, sent Glasgow reeling into a depression for many years from about 1878 to 1883. And Haley's father, already impacted by a failure at his own coal mine and where 212 men died, um, decides that they're going to go to Seattle, Washington, where there is a small uh, mining company in the hills outside of Seattle called, uh, it's an it's called Newcastle after the coal um, town in England. So they, against her will, Haley is torn from Samuel. And then Samuel is left with a decision about whether or not to follow her. And, and I'll just leave it at that. A lot of interesting historical elements at, at play there. Oh, well, let's go to Sarah. Um, you know, I mentioned I was very curious to know more about the Dole Air Race because as soon as I learned about your novel, I looked it up and what it was, and mm -hmm. I was really amazed to to learn about it and the risks that people took on in order to 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 be a part of this race. So, maybe help us understand a little bit why people were were willing to well, what it was, why people were willing to risk so much, and then the character you created in order to tell this story. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I was having been born and raised in Hawaii. I was also very surprised myself when I came upon this story because I had never heard of it. Um, and it was in 1927. So, right after Charles Lindbergh made his famous crossing to the across the Atlantic, um, James Dole, the Pineapple King, Pineapple King, um, put up a huge prize money to be the first to fix wing aircraft to fly to Hawaii. And that was a 2,400 mile trip from Oakland to Honolulu or to Oahu. And um, it became a huge deal. Everyone in the country was obsessed with it. And we had, there was a ton of, of interest um, to enter the race. And leading up to the race, though, there were some tragedies and, um, and only eight planes actually took off. But I think the, the real challenge was, you know, going to Europe is one thing to, hit a continent, even if you don't make your destination, you're probably hopefully going to hit land. But getting to this tiny speck in the middle of the ocean was a real feat of navigation. Um, and so I think that was, that was really, I think, one of the defining factors in, in who was able to go. A lot of the pilots had navigators, I think one or two did not. And um, I think my, my interest was usually I write about females and, you know, kind of strong women, but there were, the only woman in this race was a, a passenger. And so I decided because I've, in my previous books, you know, I put fictional characters into real situations, real life events that I was going to uh, create a character on my own because there were a lot of capable female pilots at that time. Um, they just weren't in the race. And so that's how Olivia West was born. Um, and then, yeah, the prize money was, it was, I think, 25,000 first prize, 10,000 for second prize, which was a huge sum of money. I think it was about $350,000 it would have been today. So that was motivation for a lot of these people to do it. A lot of people thought they were suicidal, um, you, but it was this big spirit of, of adventure, you know? And so it was a tragic story in some regards, but also it, it's, it was a wild ride. Yeah, definitely very interesting. And just to think less than 100 years since then, and you know, we get we don't think twice about getting on a plane and flying to Hawaii. You should have seen the airplanes too, that they were <laughs> just very, rud very rudimentary. Uh, well, let's go to Tara. Tara, you wrote a novel based on a minor character in Moby Dick. Uh, who was the character and what inspired you to write a story around this character? Yeah, so uh, I, I was not a Moby Dick fan uh, originally. I'd avoided kind of almost deliberately reading it, but had to. Um, I, I finished a master's degree while I was working and my kids were little. And this last class I took, I had to read Moby Dick. Um, and I very early on, there's only a few women even mentioned in the entire novel, and there's only one who has any sort of significant speaking part, and she's this innkeeper on Nantucket, and she's uh, slapstick and ridiculous, and Ishmael and Queequeg uh, kind of encounter her, and 
have all sorts of, you know, kind of over the top interactions. And um, I was so new to the novel and I was so surprised by it in so many ways. Um, and I kind of latched onto that character and I just kept thinking about her while I read the rest of the book um, and actually uh, started the project as just a short story for that class I was taking. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of kept getting longer and longer. And eventually a friend said, you know, this this could be a novel. And I went, oh, could it? And pretty soon it it was. Um, and I decided to depart from Moby Dick. The early chapters of my book do parallel a number of scenes in Moby Dick. They're, they're ones that you probably don't remember, even if you've read the book. Um, but I, I was just so interested in that, you know, we, we think of Moby Dick as this, you know, quintessential novel that captures America, but there's almost no women in it. Um, and I, I wanted to know what this woman's story was and maybe what uh, what Ishmael was missing in his interactions with her um, and just kind of kept kept running from there. Um, I, I didn't expect to write a historical novel. I, it was, this has all been a lovely surprise. Um, and I learned a lot along the way uh, about, I don't know, just so many layers of writing and research and storytelling. It sounds like you just went down a rabbit hole and could not stop. Very much I must, so. I must say, I love your little Bart Simpson doll. I have a Homer and Maggie Simpson doll above me. Which you probably can't see. Oh, perfect! Yeah, he's he was an antique store find, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> nice. Well, Eric, let's go back to you. Um, I, I kind of want to go off more from my first question. Uh, so your novel opens with the Jewish phys physician Vidal who's doing house calls. And while he's doing these house calls, there's a parade celebrating these new Catholic monarchs that have come in um, and changed things. And meanwhile, he's just got to work on paying the bills and saving people's lives and getting them the medicine they need. Um, so can you talk about the, how you, as a historical fiction writer, kind of use your craft to write these scenes but also doing so in such a way that that gives people the history of what was happening of putting us in the shoes of your characters. So the the, the second chapter of the book yeah starts as um Isabel and Ferdinand enter Granada while our main character Vidal is a doctor just trying to make house calls basically the parade is blocking some of his rounds that he has to do he has to get around it and he's interested in these new people but also he has a job to do. And I think that really, the the reason I did that did that approach was really a show don't tell situation because there's such a temp. I'm sure I imagine probably everyone on this panel has had this. There's this real temptation, especially when you start the novel, to just unload all the exposition and his history and context and thinking that oh people aren't gonna you know readers might not get it if I don't go and say all these things and explain it and. But the good thing about showing, rather than doing that, I decide I'm, I'm going to show um, Vidal going about his day. And as he goes about his day, little details will work their way in naturally. For example, he's not watching the parade. He's trying to get across the street. Um, by the time he finishes his first checkup of the day, he sees that the parade has reached um, the Alhambra Palace, where uh, the emir of um, the Muslim emirs to uh, surrender to the Catholic monarchs. And really, that was a really good way to do it's a what's called a, a third person subjective approach to the story that it's just from Vidal's point of view. So we only see and find out what Vidal knows, um, which gives it a which is helpful because it alleviates me from having to a explain too much, which I think would not be a very interesting read. But also it allows me to um, it allows me to not say things that Vidal wouldn't know. And that makes it much simpler. It's, this is just Vidal's story. There just so happens to be this major world history event occurring in the background. You kind of do the same with Catalina. Can you let our viewers know a little bit about who she is and what what part of the story she's able to tell? So Catalina is Vidal's oldest daughter. And the, the thing with Catalina is while the rest of the family leaves to go and start over their life in Africa, um, Catalina has actually married in, has married and converted into a Catholic family prior to the arrival of Ferdinand Isabella. Um, so she's already decided that she's a Jew who's converted to Catholicism. She's going to stay with her husband. And she has no idea what's going to happen with the Spanish Inquisition and sort of um, the scrutiny that her conversion is going to be put up against. 
So the way that the novel approaches the Spanish Inquisition, which was really just starting during this time period, is showing Catalina trying to navigate this um, quickly changing world that's changing into a Catholic kingdom after her parents are gone and showing how she navigates um, the Inquisition that she does not know is as dangerous as we all know. So there's sort of, we get this, um, we as the reader, the modern reader, get this perspective on what she's doing and how unsafe it can be because she's doing things like um, going to the Jewish cemetery, checking up on um, a, a sister of hers that died in childbirth, not realizing that she's exposing herself as a um, as a potential false convert. Uh, which could be so, which was the most dangerous thing you could be during the Inquisition. So really, that was the same thing. It was a way to tell a story about a person caught up in the Inquisition, um, rather than uh, telling a story about the Inquisition itself. Yeah, I th I, you know, it was a really good way to bring in those those Jews that did become converts, rather than than leave their homes. Uh, well, let's go to to Robin again. Um, in our little pre-interview, we, you know, Sarah kind of revealed that she's from Hawaii and she's written all these books about Hawaii. And I think those readers of hers knows that she has this kind of love of place. And I think you have that as well with the Pacific Northwest. So can you talk about uh, your love of place and how that comes out as not just a setting, but a character in your novel? Yeah, um, that that is actually really important to me. Um, I have it's my fourth novel. Two of my novels are set in Albany, New York, where I grew up. And a third is set in Paris, which is a city I love and have visited a lot. So when I was thinking about my goal being to write a, a love story set in the 19th century continent spanning, I again thought of all the places I love and that are meaningful to me. And there are about there are there were three elements that sort of glued this novel together. Um, one is that um, I Seattle is my chosen home. I live here because in second grade, I heard about the Space Needle and I thought that was the coolest thing in the universe. So I decided that when I grew up, I would live in Seattle and through a circuitous route, I made it here. And I have lived here since 1980. It's my chosen home. And we have lived on Cougar Mountain, where part of the novel is set for 32 or 33 years. So I, I find it's very easy to write about place if you've been there a long time, because you have that sense of what it smells like, what it feels like, all those senses that you can use. And you sort of absorb um, the zeitgeist of the place. But I needed my characters to be from somewhere. And so my maiden name is Fraser, And I went to Scotland to see if my characters could come from there. And the second I stepped foot on Scottish soil, about three things happened. One, I felt completely at home immediately. It was as if my DNA were vibrating. Secondly, the, the landscape there uh, resembles that of Western Washington, which is a place I love. And thirdly, my family comes from there. The Frasers come from the Highlands of Scotland. And so finally, I had, a, I had that particular piece. A wonderful bonus was that um, the best ships in the world were built in Scotland during that time. So I kept that in mind as something that might be able to connect with Seattle. And the third place that I concentrated on were the San Juan Islands, which are islands in the north of Puget Sound uh, in the Salish Sea. I have been visiting them since 1980. It is Paris and the San Juan Islands, five for the center of my heart. And one day when I was uh, biking around the island, I happened on these ruins on the island that were stone architecture. They looked nothing like anything else on the island. And uh, they looked like the architecture from Scotland. And I just thought, you know, who who built those ruins and why? And then as a novelist, I thought I'm, that's going in a book someday. And so when I have these like three elements, I can write a book, but setting as character, I like to think of setting as character in the sense that if I write, this love story where the story takes place is 
going to have a deep impact on the story. In other words, the story would take a different turn or if it were in San Francisco or if they were from France, there'd be different values, different um, situations. It's kind of like A.B. Guthrie, the, you know, the, um, his books highlighting the Wild West or, you know, Ivan Doeg highlighting Montana. I wanted to write a novel where where they came from and where they were had such a huge impact on the story that it would be different if it were written anywhere else. I, I think you phrased that just perfectly there at the end, that it would be written differently if it happened anywhere else. And now I yeah, I would love to visit Cougar Mountain in the San, San Juan Islands. I've been out there a couple of times, but not specifically to the San Juan Islands. <clears throat> you must come, it's gorgeous. They are beautiful. Yeah. Um, I've got some more questions for our panelists before I get to those. I'm going to post that link again to the landing page. If any of these um, novels have strike your interest, go ahead and head over there to pick those up. Um, and also start thinking about uh, some questions you have for our panelists. In about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll start inviting questions from the audience. And uh, you can post those in the chat once we get there. Uh, Sarah, let's go back to you. Uh, you have a dual timeline uh, novel. Um, tell us you know, why you crafted your novel this way and what the connections are between the two narratives. Um, so I think in my, my previous novel, The Codebreaker's Secret was my first dual timeline novel. And um, in writing that, so it was set in 1943 and 1965. Um, and the pilot from World War II then is in the second storyline um, 20 years later. And it was it allowed me to, um, you know, to explore the effects on, you know, people during the war 20 years later and how their lives were then. And so I realized kind of the power of that to to maybe answer questions that you can't really answer in that one timeline. And so with Olivia West, I thought it would be the, a good idea to do the same thing. Um, so I have her Olivia West and she's doing the race. She's a, picked as a navigator, but as um, I don't want to give away, but you'll, you know, if you read it, you'll see what happens in the race. Um, and then I also have a character named Ren, who is 60 years later. She inherits this old dilapidated barn on the big island out in the boonies. And um, there are old artifacts in the barn. And so um, that kind of allowed, because there was some mystery leading or in kind of mystery involved in the race, that allowed me to explore and sort of um, uncover these, these buried secrets. I wouldn't have been able to do that with just one timeline. And also, um, so how they come together, um, she ends up working Ren, the 1987 storyline, ends up working at a retirement home um, as a as a part time job. For her, it's kind of a coming of age story. So while she's at this dilapidated barn, she kind of trying to refurbish it, and she gets a part time job. And so these residents of the old folks' home actually help her um, uncover the secrets about the race, and and they help her with that. And I'm curious, as you develop the story, what were some of the challenges of making the narratives overlap and connect and, you know, just issues of clarity for the reader? Like, what kind of things did you run into during your revisions? Well, it's always tricky. The hardest part is to figure out where to weave them together without giving stuff away, you know, because you have to, well, it's like, well, I can't put this here because we don't know this yet or that yet. So but I always write the first storyline first. So I wrote the whole 1927 storyline and then I wrote the other one. And then I would, I just kind of had to write down each chapter and then weave them together. Um, and for the most part that worked, um, there may have been one or two places where, where my editor was like, you, you got to move this. Um, but that, that really seems to work for me because it worked well with Codebreaker's Secret and so I'm just sticking to that formula. 
Yeah, there's there's lots of little things you you know you don't really think about until you're there. And I know Eric and I had some issues with get, not giving away information in one timeline, you know, between Catalina and Vidal. So I'm sure, yeah, you ran into some of the same things. It is. It's challenging, but it's kind of you know it's fun. It's like doing a puzzle when you get to that point where you're actually putting them together. Um, and I think you know it adds it adds if you do them well and I. Fortunately, the feedback has been like people enjoy both timelines, um, but it adds an element of also just natural suspense in there because I didn't switch every chapter. I think I was more Olivia heavy in the beginning and then more Ren heavy towards the end and then they come together. Um, but, you know, it builds, it adds in sort of just automatically. You have to wait now. Okay, you finish Olivia's chapter and then you have to read Ren's and... Mm -hmm. Hopefully they're equally as intriguing. Yeah. Well, Tara, your in your story, you have some magical realism with Angeline's ability to glimpse and reform recent memories uh, from the those around her. Uh, so just tell us a little bit more about this ability she has and how you were able how and why you're able to incorporate this magical realism into your narrative. So I started my writing career as a journalist in my 20s, and uh, that's a very quick way to learn just how differently different people can see one thing and tell a completely different story. Um, and that's been a, a big interest of me and uh, for me in all my writing is how different people interpret events and especially how stories um, tend to change over time. And when this became a generational novel, um, that idea of, of memory and its fragility and its malleability um, Kind of took on some new meaning. It was there when it was just a short story about Evangeline, um, but it it as I revised, kind of gained new meaning and new shape. Um, so all the narrate there's four narrators, um, there's four generations in my novel, and each has a slightly different power related to perception and memory. Um, and some of that is just because of the the interest I have in what type of stories to tell, and some of it's just because I I love novels that are a little strange. Um, and that have some magic in them. And I couldn't really imagine writing something that wasn't. Um, in, in some places that became the challenge as a writer was to, to justify it being there. Um, and writing about women in times and places where they were not always given a lot of power. Um, it was interesting writing characters that had these really unique powers, but still were constrained by the environment around them, the people around them who did not in various ways want to let them uh, make their own choices in life. Um, and then it became really interesting also to look at how those characters then viewed their own abilities. Um, and, you know, Evangeline is in some ways very scared of what she can do and she uses it because it's how she survives. So her, um, the, the little bit of information we get about her and Moby Dick is that uh, her husband is away and she's running this in by herself. And that's never expanded on or explained in any way. And I uh, introduce it that her husband has actually died in an accident and she has been gently nudging the memories of everyone around her to convince them that he is on his way home at any moment so that they'll basically leave her alone and let her continue her business. Um, but as she ages, as she has a, a child of her own, um, as she goes through and sees the consequences of both how she uses her power and how she fears her power, it, it changed the nature, changes the nature of the entire story. Um, so there's, there's a lot of layers to it. Uh, I think it was really fun to infuse that into historical fiction because it, it was an added challenge for me as a writer to learn all of these things about these places and the people who would have lived there and then say, okay, but what if this other thing was going on too? I come to historical fiction as um, a historian and, you know, I started my, you know, I wrote a master's thesis long before I ever wrote a novel. So I think of magical realism as, as a risk, like something I'd be really scared to take on. It sounds like it was a little more natural for you. Who did you rely on, you know, some stories that, that you were familiar with? Did you read some authors that do some of the same things? How did you kind of pick up on that? Yeah, so I for me the risk was historical fiction. I will tell you that I had uh, at one point years and years ago gone to a workshop on historical fiction and went, oh, I'm never going to do that. That sounds too hard. Um, it, it was delightfully hard. Um, but I yeah, I I read a lot. I honestly read. I read just 
for fun a lot of magical realism and science fiction and fantasy. So a lot of things that are in much more fantastical worlds than the one I was working with, but really examining how those writers use the the magic or the science or the unbelievable thing to draw something out of the story that is very, very familiar to us. So um, writers that I kind of turn to a lot, I love N.K. Jemisin, who's a science fiction writer. I love um, Catherine Arden, uh, who's doing some, it, her stories are somewhat historical, but also very, very magical. Um, Naomi Novik, who is just like straight up fantasy. Um, so looking at a lot of that, and then I did kind of go back and, and look for writers as I was writing this who were working with um, slightly surreal or surprising worlds, uh, or even just, you know, worlds that acknowledge the mythological and magical factors of our world. So um, The Red Tent, which is an older novel uh, that's uh, it's older, it's like 25 years old, um, set uh, in in biblical times. So it's the story of Jacob's wives um, is, is very deeply magical, but also very deeply uh, realistic in a number of ways. And I read that early on. Um, I read some Isabel Allende while I was writing this. Um, and I think I, I, I read 100 years, uh, a thousand years of solitude. Uh, while I was writing Isn't that 100, 100 years. years. I, I should not mess that up. But I, I read 100 years of solitude while I was writing this also, though it I, I wouldn't say it's like related in any way, but just seeing um, the freedom that writers get from just chasing what interests them, no matter how strange it is. Um, and that was something important for, for me was to acknowledge that like, I like a good weird story and I wanted to write a weird story. Well, that's a, a very good explanation. I feel <laughs> a little ashamed for being not willing to risk that. But yeah, you made a very Every good writer is their own thing. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, Eric, I want to go to you now. I have a little bit of a, a heavier question for you. Um, I actually just wrote for, for our blog, you know, I've, we've been writing about your novel, South of Sephirod, and the history of the Jewish people. Uh, it, you know, it turns out the Alhambra decree is is just one of many of these edicts or decree exiling Jewish people from from where they are. Um, and then, of course, you know, nowadays we have Israel and Palestine, which has continued to be an issue for you know over a half century. Can you talk about the you know the importance, the relevance of writing a novel like this, and what some of the connections are to our our world today, and why it's important to explore these historical events through story? Sure, that's a big question. Um, so I think I mean one of the biggest reasons that I wrote the novel that I that I actually wrote it and was able to finish it and didn't wasn't just one of the projects that I wanted to write was that. I felt that it was so relevant to today's world, even when I started writing it back in, um, I started writing it back in 2019. And for many reasons, one, um, the, the the aspect of um, the, the Jewish people being um, forced out was a very, you know, has happened so many times in history. Um, Anti-Semitism is on the rise again. I actually originally wrote the book because it's sort of a response to the idea of, um, if you remember, where was it? Um, Charlottesville, uh, and I think in 2017, they would say things like the Jews will not replace us. That was like the first um, big, like uh, anti-Semitism in the 21st century that I that I'd seen in a in a big way. Um, and then on top of that, it doesn't. It's not, and it I think it expands beyond the uh, the Jewish experience though, because so much of this book is about uh, mass migration, which is happening all over the world today. Um, it's about xenophobia, um, forced separation of families. And I think for me, you know, this book takes place in 1492 and it is a historical fiction, but I often feel like so many of the things that these characters are going through is exactly what's happening in uh, 2024 and has been happening for a while. Um, and I think that the second question you were asking was about uh, why it's important to write about this. So I, I, I think yeah. it's important. I think it's important because the hope is that we'll learn. Um, we're supposed to learn from history. We're supposed to. There's this um, expression, if those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. So the idea is if we can just see the mistakes that we made in the past, learn from them and move on, then hopefully things will will get better. And I, I think with writing historical fiction, especially the idea is, um, I understand not everyone wants to learn history. And I understand the, the very idea of the topic can be 
can be boring for people for so but the hope is that you know people love to read people love a good story so the hope is that with historical fiction it's a way to sort of trojan horse in um a history lesson um and i i will leave this on a more positive note this question uh by saying also that i i do think that we do have the capability to learn from history um i think that the world is a better place because there are we haven't fixed all the problems of the past but there are things that are from the past that have stayed in the past and we've we as a species and society have grown from them so the hope is that we'll just keep moving in that direction yeah definitely well thank you so much for talking about that and you know i just don't think it's i being what the novel is about i think it is important to talk about it and continue to to share that history and share those stories uh, well, I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Uh, before I get to those, I do want to give Sarah a chance to uh, answer the question about love of place, because I, I uh, let Robin talk about her love of place. So, Sarah, if you could just talk about uh, your your home there in Hawaii and and why you love to tell stories about it. Um. Well, yeah, so my parents both grew up here as well, and my family goes way back. Um, and kind of like when you went to Scotland, Robin, maybe like that's how I felt when I moved from Oahu to the Big Island where my family had been for many, many generations. Um, it's like this island is alive. And that's where I wrote my first novel. It was set here where the Marines were um, just before they, they were training for Iwo Jima. Um, but and also I was thinking when Robin was talking too, like when you live somewhere and you know it so well, it is, it makes it so much easier to write about and write about well. And to, so that like when I read, I love to read books where I just feel like I'm in this place, you know, where I'm totally transported. And so I think if, if you know a place so well that you are able to do that for, for your readers and, um, you know, my books take place on several of the islands and I've, I've lived on Oahu, I've lived on the big island. And um, just, you know, when when there's snow on Mauna Kea or when the plovers arrive or, you know, what it smells like when you're walking through a Kiavi forest. I mean, just all those kind of little details, I think they make such a difference. And and even though my books are World War II, they are I think they're lighter. They're on the lighter side and they are um, they're more stories of the people that were living here during the war. Um, not entirely, but. And so I think it just, it was such an important time. And I think um, for us as a country and us in Hawaii that um, I just love to to bring it to life. And I think with, with knowing your setting, you're able to do that. And I think so much, so much, so many of us only see Hawaii in movies or we just go there for a vacation <laughs> and we don't know much about it. So I think that's really great to share those yeah. stories from there the history there's a lot of history here i ran a marathon on Kauai, so oh really yeah that's the one time i've been to hawaii i haven't been to the other islands yet though Kauai is beautiful all right we've got some questions coming in and there's actually a question for me so i'm going to answer that real quick so margaret asks i'm wondering if you could share with us how history through fiction distributes its print books didn't see anything on your dis website about distribution so we um, have worldwide distribution via Ingram Spark print on demand. Um, so yeah, they distribute it to all um, online retailers. And then I just do my best reaching out to bookstores. We're a member of the Midwest Independent Booksellers Association and just try to connect with bookstores and and get the books out there. But uh, Margaret, you can email me at editor at history through fiction com if you've got more questions and I can try to answer those. Um, we've got a question from Edie, and this is for Eric. She asks, as a person of both Sephardic and uh, Ashkenazi, uh, uh, how do you say that, Eric? Ashkenazi. Um, descent, I'm glad this history is being visited. Can Eric speak to why he delved into Sephardic experiences? So it, it really had everything to do with this idea. Um, I, Growing up, I never heard the story of the expulsion of the Jews. I um, the story, I, I like to tell people that basically in Hebrew school, we went straight from the Torah to the Holocaust, and there was this 2,000 year gap in the middle of it. And I knew that there were things that were there. I, I was aware of the Spanish Inquisition, um, 
but didn't know much much about it. I, I mainly knew about it because thanks to Mel Brooks and Monty Python, um, if anyone gets that reference. Uh, but the reason when I first heard about the um, expulsion, I was I was visiting Spain and I was surprised that I'd never heard this story before. And I started, I'm a reader, so I wanted to find books on the topic. And I started to look, especially novels, and I started to look and there's really pretty much nothing, a few things here and there, but um, no novels on it, even very few um, history books written in English. So for me, it was all about, um, there was this book that I wanted to read a book about the expulsion and I couldn't find it. So that was really what it was about. And um, through that, I was able to delve into Sephardic experiences and figure out the um, the customs, the culture, et cetera. But also on top of that, figuring out the difference between Sephardic experiences as they are experienced today and Sephardic experiences as they, as they would have been in, in 1492. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we have a question from Ryan. He asks, I was interested to hear about the multiple timelines and protagonists. What key piece of advice would you give a writer working with multiple protagonists or what's an important pitfall to avoid? So I'll just kind of throw that one up in the air if anybody wants to hop on and answer that question. I can jump on that one first, sure. I guess. Um, first, I would say don't try writing your first novel with four first person narrators. It's not easy. Um, I, uh, But for me, what, what helped as I started trying to really make those four different voices really distinctive was um, deciding what my characters were kind of fixated on or what they were really tuned into and how that would shape what they would notice about the world, how it would shape the way they listen to other people talk, what kind of uh, details they picked up from their environment, what kind of uh, beliefs they had about themselves in the world, um, and even all the way down to little details like what punctuation they used, uh, you know, I used to capture their voice. Um, and it, it took a lot of editing and refinement to really get there, uh, but it I think eventually paid off. I think it's entirely possible to write a multiple perspective story, uh, first or third person, um, with just a lot of attention to detail. Yeah, I'll just I'll just jump on too and say I agree with that. It's when you're writing, I have two protagonists. Um, I have in the past written um, um, an omnipotent narrator. This time the omnipotent narrator is gone and it's just two third person narrators, but from deep within their consciousness. And what that poses when you're writing the novel, when you reach uh, plot twists and turns, you're trying to keep the reader um, sort of ignorant about some things and knowledgeable about others. So th there's still the suspense that um that drives the novel forward and drives a reader to read so that i might know what the reader will know what one person is doing but they also know that the other person doesn't know what that person wants and what has happened to them and that's just a bit of a dance so that when the plot twists and turns come together um it has the most impact for the reader and that sometimes is where is the, you know, where is the cliff going to be that you jump to the next person so that that impact is stronger. And that's just, uh, I'm just going to say that's just rewriting. And <clears throat> sometimes an editor can step in and say, you know, this would be better if this person didn't know this aspect of the other person's life at this very point. And it's it's just a dance, and it's it's not something that comes easily. It's just a matter of over and over again until when you read it, everything sings at just the right moment. If that helps, yeah. There's this really very subtle, and I see that as an editor when an author, you know, when we're going to publish a manuscript, I have to go through and kind of pick out those little points of views when you slip into the mind of another character accidentally. It's kind of hard to notice all the all of them unless you have a good editor. I'll also say I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I I really been having a hard time with the omnipotent point of view because, like I, I it allows you to tell so much more and give a broader story, but I I just can't get engaged with it, and I feel kind of bad when authors submit something that's written well done and the omnipotent it just isn't appealing to me for some reason. Well, for me, that omnipotent point of view is best used when you can start way out here, but 
you can manipulate your all, yourself all the way into somebody's mind and pull yourself back out again as the omnipotent person. So sometimes it's just a matter of control on the part of the author. Uh, we've got a couple of comments and Robin, since you were just speaking, Lorraine says, not a question, but a comment for Robin. Just finished a wild and heavenly place and found myself crying at the beauty of the ending. Working on my review, so a pleasure to hear you discuss the historical novel. So congratulations, Robin, on that. Thank you, and thank you, Lorraine. I really appreciate it. And then Susie says, I love Sarah's books and that they are set in Hawaii, where we have vacation frequently since 1986, a favorite place of ours. I'm excited to um, read Robin's. We have lived... We have loved living in the Seattle area for 31 years, love the San Juan Islands and also Scotland. And then we have a, uh, we have a question for Eric, um, and it really could apply to anyone. Um, I want to compliment Eric on his research regarding Spain in the late 1400s. When did you find your story amidst the re research? So, you know, really for anyone here, as you're diving into all that research, how do you find a narrative in there, you know, an engaging narrative in order to tell a fictional story? I, I can cue that one up. So with me, it was off the bat, I so I know a lot of people maybe go and do the research first and then have the story emerge from there. But I off the bat, there was a, a question I want answered, which was um, what happened to the people who left Spain? Because I couldn't really find it all that easily. And so I decided to answer that question. I'll write a novel about a family leaving Spain. Um, and then everything around everything else I had to create around that because I, I knew that I knew from at least that much that people did leave. So I had that research and um, the story actually the history and the research really aided the story, especially the um, the structure and plotting of the story, because I knew that um, the Alhambra decree is um, passed down in March and they all have to leave by July. So really, I had within that I had three months where these characters can sort of do whatever they need to do to get out of Spain. Um, that's a really broad overview of how the research fit the story, but everything else that I found out about from the, even the tiniest details, if I could find a way to fit it in, I would I would make sure that it made it into the story because I feel that those those details are what make it feel richer. Does anyone else want to speak to that about how you, when do you stop the research and start to write a story? Um, I'll say something. Yes, I really feel like um, there's a point, there's always a little bit of magic to writing a novel. And for me, when I, I do a lot of research beforehand, um, and I already have a kind of a loose plot, but usually once I start researching, I, I find very fascinating pieces of information that I didn't even know about that actually make the story so much better and like introduce a whole new character or um and that's the beauty I find with research it's it gives you an answer that you couldn't even imagined so it's fun that way and finally we have a question for Robin from Lorraine uh, speaking about the links that you went to to do authentic research well, I'm sure that, uh, thanks, Lorraine. I'm sure that anybody here can answer this question as well. I mean, we all go to great lengths to, I mean, Sarah just spoke to finding something while she's looking for something else. And then suddenly you have a whole new plot line. You have a whole new twist in the novel that you never saw coming. But, you know, for me, I, um, you know, I'm very heavy on primary research uh, materials. I have been, in the basement of the Musée d'Orsay for one novel and um, digging through the archives in uh, in Washington, D.C. in the Library of Congress and walking on battlefields. Um, for this particular one, since I live here where a lot of the novel takes place, it's old maps and city directories and diaries, if I can find them. and looking through old newspapers and looking at, you know, how, you know, I mean, you start to write these things and you think things like, was there running water in Seattle then? How did they do that? So the next thing you know, you're calling somebody who might know somebody in the water department who might have some idea about whether they actually even had, if they had cisterns, if they had wells. So those are the kinds of things that um, I'm sure that everybody here has gone through when you try to, as Eric says, you know, make the 
the text just jump from the page so that the reader doesn't feel almost like they're reading, but it feels like they've traveled back in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm continually impressed by historical fiction authors, you know, at, on the podcast now I've done 70 or so interviews and it's just amazing the amount of work that all of you put into creating these stories and you don't earn enough money for, for the work that you do. So um, mm -hmm. that's too bad. It's funny. Um, somebody recently read my novel and pointed out, you know, there's just things you don't, you overlook, you know, you work so hard at getting all these details, right? Well, uh, my epilogue takes play in, place in present day and there's a Tesla and I put a clutch in a, in a manual transmission in it. And somebody pointed out, uh, these, they do not have that. <laughs> just little things you just overlook sometimes. Mm -hmm. You should say if the Dakota had won the war, they would have had that. Okay. <laughs> I wrote an alternate history. So. Well, I want to, uh, we're coming up against uh, the hour here. I want to thank uh, all of our attendees. And I do want to thank, um, this is a free event, but I, I did get some donations, which I really appreciate because um, the, the Zoom platform and Eventbrite, there are some costs to those. So I really appreciate those who are able to contribute. Um, I want to thank our panelists. This has been a really great conversation. I'll post uh, that link once again in the chat here in just a minute. Um, and I will let everyone know that the the uh, recording will be on Facebook on History Through Fiction's Facebook page. I'm also going to upload the video to our YouTube channel if you want to watch it there. And again, just thank you to everyone for being a part of this. Uh, before we go, I always ask our panelists one final question, and that is, what is the value of historical fiction? Why write this story, not as history, but as historical fiction, especially since we are history through fiction. Uh, so I want to start with Tara, because Tara already indicated that she didn't, had never intended to write historical fiction, but then, I don't know, you must have spent many, many hours and years uh, plotting a way to, to get that done. So why? Why spend all that time to create this story through historical fiction? You know, honestly, I think it's, it's the reason you write any story is you want to give people something to empathize with something where even if it is you know completely outside of their experience which history always is completely outside of our experience it's a way to enter it and feel like you can understand something new about it that maybe you can't get from nonfiction. thank you tara uh eric do you want to tackle this one sure i, I think i said uh something I, I think i sort of answered it before but uh i think Entertainment, I just want people to be able to learn something while also hopefully having a good time. Um, I know I wasn't I wasn't always the most engaged uh, student in my history classes in middle school and high school, but I was always engaged when I was reading a book about history. So for me, it's um that's how that's why I think it's important. That's why people should read it. Thank you, Eric. And Robin, how about you? What is the value of historical fiction? Well, I think uh one of the things I keep in mind when I'm writing is that um, circumstances will change, but human nature will not. And I completely agree with Eric that, you know, you try to illuminate the fact that we are still having the same problems today that we had 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. And if that starts to click with some readers, um, then we can understand something about our humanity and, and the choices that we make. Yeah, very well said. And finally, Sarah, what, what is the value of historical fiction for you? Um, I think that so as humans, we are wired for story, our brains are wired for story. And um, I just, I really believe that. And so what, what we remember is what we feel and more like our the emotions that we that are elicited when we're reading this. And so you know, we'll remember that versus just a textbook. And I think that's, that's where the magic again is. Yeah, the magic, definitely. Well, thanks again to everyone. Thanks to our attendees. Thanks for our panelists. I hope everyone has a really great uh, evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Aloha, everybody. <laughs>